Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So the next film that we talk about is with Andreas, the, uh, one of the co-directors of the film The War Show, and this is a look into uh, what's going on in a part of the world that we continue to hear a great deal about, but it's, 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 it's a film that, that puts a real human face on what's happening currently in Syria and around. And the film is not afraid to, and the directors are not afraid to take on the real issues and to kind of situate us in a, in, 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 in a context that I don't think uh, we've ever really seen before. And as Andreas says, the two things for him, one, we have to think less of killing, and two, we've got to stop barrel bombing. And so this is uh, just two of the conclusions coming out of this film. But it's a great film. It's a great doc. It's something, it's an important film as well. And your the music is <laughs> is astounding. And it will, it will pull you uh, in right from the get-go. So The War Show is an interview. It's coming up with uh, one of the co-directors of the film, davidpecklive.com, rabble.ca for more interviews on the Toronto International Film Festival and others. So check us out online and coming up, The War Show. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We're joined by a very special guest today, a filmmaker who is responsible for uh, what I would call a really important uh, film, an important documentary that's being very well received here at the Toronto International Film Festival, uh, Andreas Desgul. Desgul. Ah, uh, good. Close. It's fine. <laughs> uh, and uh, your co-director, uh, Obada Zetun. Yep. Excellent. Good. I'm always a little concerned about getting everybody's name right. So, so um, the film, The War Show, is difficult, a difficult film to, to say the least, and yet a deeply uh, compelling and engaging uh, music draws you in, in in a way that almost made me feel a little bit, um, almost made me feel a little bit guilty. Guilty? In yeah. What sense? I'm, well, maybe it's conviction, actually, Andreas. Maybe, maybe that's it. I mean, I've certainly seen a lot of doc film over the years, but bringing into this issue, this Middle Eastern Syrian issue, in a way that was very human. Mm-hmm. Well, the music in itself is a is a very interesting story. It's the Canadian saxophone player called Colin Stetson, who's within music a, a worldwide name, and he's contributed to to other films like Twelve Years a Slave. And the story about our collaboration was that I visited Obi uh, Obeda um, in her apartment between Christmas and New Year's, and she was in Denmark. And at the same time, she was in Syria. What that means is that she was in her hometown, Sabadani, through Skype. Her hometown had been under siege for three years at the time. In the last six months, it had been cut off from any f sort of food supplies. So uh, people were basically dying of hunger. Mm. And this, this is a town of 45,000 people. Um, so she could sit on Skype and follow this because right. internet was still working. And um, her being in Denmark, following this pain, streaming that pain in a way, that's a term that she uses, mm. um, was of course very tough on her. At the same time, I then came and visited her in her apartment and she was listening to the music of Colin Stetson, mm. which, who uses a very special technique called almost like circular breathing. Okay. Um, and through that, he can actually produce several tones at the same time. Hmm. And it's very connected to breathing. If you go online and watch his videos of him playing the saxophone, it's just it's an immense experience. It's very powerful. So Obeda and I, we looked at each other and we just said, this has got to be the music for the film. So, so not, not digitized. This is all... It's everything it's is made just it's by him. It's his throat, it's his voice, yeah. it's his breathing. It's his, yeah. wow. and, and, and mostly Diaphragm. happening all at the same time. Wow. Um, and it also connects to a feeling that runs through Obeda and, and many other Syrians, which is not being able to breathe. And 
when the revolution came, they call it themselves a moment where suddenly they were allowed to breathe. Yes. And it also comes with feeling repression culturally, uh, not being allowed the kind of freedoms you want as a woman, and, and having to fight like crazy to carve your, your way in life. And um, so Obeda really has this thing about teaching Syrians to breathe because they don't know how to breathe. Right. Right. And that connects to, to Colin Stetson. And, and then when we, when we heard his music, when it came, it was just a wow experience. It, it completely, it completely um, matches the f emotions that we wanted. I love how she says she wanted to, uh, in, the, in the sound booth, wanted to broadcast forbidden songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, um, it's like communicating on another um, frequency. Another thing related to other frequencies is that this breathing and streaming of, of pain is very much connected to the prison system in Colombia, in, sorry, in Syria, um, in the sense that every family more or less have mm. members in prison. Um, Obeda has many f friends and family who, who are either in prison, have been in prison or disappeared in prison. And what happens when you're put in prison in Syria is that Oftentimes you disappear. Nobody can figure out where you are, right. what has happened to you. Um, sometimes you never reappear or nobody will ever figure it out. Um, so she talks about that there is a frequency that she experiences where she communicates on a mental level mm. with friends and family in prison, imagining their pain mm -hmm. as a sort of mm. stream. and. I've spoken to um, people who've been in prison who, who experienced the same thing, where they, not knowing their fate or anything, not being able to communicate with the outside, still feel a very strong presence of friends and family. How do you think that outside. translates to, to me, the audience, to me, the listener, to me, the, the guy who consumes news in the Western world or in the, other, in the majority world? No, sorry, not the majority world, the minority world, our, our side of the world, the developed side of the world, where there's so much noise. Um, um, you know, how do you, I mean, as, as filmmakers, you want people to see this film. Clearly, you want to get this message out. I mean, the, one of the lines, for me, one of the themes of, of the festival this year, and by the way, congratulations on the film. It's utterly brilliant. Um, one of the uh, rebels, I think, that you interview, that you catch on screen says, quote, silence in the face of injustice is complicity with the devil. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we hear about Syria all the time. You know, it's easy to find the stats. Is it four, you know, four, four, four and a half million people displaced, and how many people killed, and people? In, it's just, it's insane. And yeah. yet, and yet, there seems to be this ongoing silence of a sort. How do you get through? Well, I think the silence more relates to uh, that. In the flow of news, there's a reproduction of, of just events that are happening, but there's very little analysis and depth mm. and, and very little human depth. So it actually um, makes us as um, you know, so pe people witnessing from, from afar, it makes us uh, connect less. Uh, so the, the idea that the more you see, the more you connect, it actually oftentimes has the opposite effect. Um, I think documentary can, can bridge that. The reason I talk about prison is because I think that that's one of the major issues today that really has to be looked at and dealt with mm. regarding Syria because mm. we um, it's it's hard to come with a clear answer about what should happen with peace right. negotiations. I mean, and that's the, the question I want to ask you, right? What do you but, learn but, about but negotiating? A, but there's a huge task in putting pressure on the Assad regime to release the hundreds of thousands that are in prison to uh, account for their fates. There are family Syrians everywhere, and I've met many, who um, are in desperate situations because they don't know what happened to their loved ones. 500,000 still in prison, I think, according to the UN. Is that right? Yeah, it's I mean, something obviously, at I some point it, it yeah. just almost becomes meaningless, right? A and and big. documented, it's 60,000 that have been killed in a torture. 60,000, wow. but, but that's just a number that's documented. It's probably much more. And we also have to understand that the Assad regime has been very deliberate 
in attacking moderates in society. And what you've, the people that have been in prison are is to a great extent moderates because uh, they wanted and have always sought to cover a situation where they are the better choice against radical extremists. Mm, mm. And by taking out the moderates, they, they have basically created that situation very actively. And that means that you have a whole generation that's in prison in, in, in Syria or who have fled. And, and they should have been the ones who could build the future of Syria, but, right. but they're gone. Andrews, is, it, is this kind of change, I mean, you know, so there's, you know, you think of revolutions, and revolutions typically are, you know, bubbling below the surface for, for a long time, and then boom, they, they hit. Um, and I, you know, as a development guy, I'm, I'm all about incremental change, you know, little things making a big difference, the domino effect, etc. I mean, how do you affect, you know, having seen this and lived it, you know, in this film uh, for, how, how long was the project, all in? Well, uh, I've been involved for um, less than two years, but the whole process of the film goes back to 2011. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a long time to be living and, and, and breathing this, and, 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 and in, you know, from the inside and the out, um, and a beautiful way that you humanized, I think, this issue, uh, you know, I think for, for so many. Is there a better way to deal with it? I mean, it just seems so, you know, it's, what a ridiculous thing to say, it seems so rebellious. You know, pick up your, you know, and you go in and you dive in head first. Might have there been a softer sell? Does that, is that is that just a crazy question? Yeah, I, I think it's no. I think don't think it's a crazy question, but I, I, I doubt that that reality could have ever mm. um, occurred, given the way that the Assad regime acted. The, like the the brutality of the regime. I mean, the brutality of the regime was a deliberate strategy to push the revolution into a more violent direction. Because the regime was never interested in a, in a peaceful opposition movement. That's the most dangerous thing for, for their goal, which is to keep, keep power. And, um, and if you uh, talk with Obeda about um, this, this revolution, and she says it very early on in the film, in, in the radio, she talks about, if we try to change our situation, will life get better or will mm. it get worse? Mm. Mm. So it was a, a question that was very much out in the open among many people at the time. And she describes it herself as it was a moment of throwing up, a throwing up period. That there was so much pus in society that right. had been building up yep. that it had needed a release. And, and that this release was more than anything about release and rebellion than it was really about uh, clear political goals. But, um, but so much pressure had been put on society that um, it just had to happen. I don't know if it was her that said this or someone else that was being interviewed, but uh, the, 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 the quote was, uh, or at least the notion was, that the Syrian people had pretended to be happy for too long. Mm -hmm. They had just, you know, so there was almost a silence within their own culture that put up with this, you know, political nonsense for so many years, and then boom, it, it was like it popped. Very much, but, but the, the Assad regime in Syria was considered for many years to be one of the most closed countries mm. in, in, uh, in the world. 40, so, 40 years in power, So it, yes. it's 40 years. Yeah. So um, we have to keep that in mind that it's, it's a special situation. And, and also there is a scene in the movie where a man talks about how he was in prison and he was put in front of a judge. And, and the judge then asks him, right. why are you um, chanting for freedom? It's a great what moment. is freedom? Define it for me. And then he explains how he, he answered the judge. I can't. Don't ask me to define freedom. I can't because I never experienced it and neither can any Syrian. But, but we know it's not this. Yeah. We know it's not what we're currently living. We can feel that from the inside out. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really telling moment uh, where we don't, we don't know what we want. But we got to. It's it's got to be better than, than than what we currently have. The young the young girl, the beautiful face at the beginning of the film. <laughs> I want my freedom. I want to play. And, I mean, the things that we take for granted. I mean, I do a fair bit of work overseas. Uh, a lot of work in Cambodia, actually, and mm. so been very aware of a, a, a difficult um, situation for so many years. Uh, mental health, PTSD, landmines, civil war, the genocide, and so on. The list goes on. No idea. We have no idea. And it's film like this, it seems to me, that, that, that 
I don't know, the gadfly? Is that, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but, but, the, 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 the irritant in, in culture that says, help us, help us, you know, come alongside, make a difference. And the difficult thing today, I think, seeing the Assad regime becoming rather stable with right. the support of Russia. Right. Um, there is more and more openness globally to um, reach a peace agreement that might even keep the Assad regime in power. Um, from a pragmatic point of view, it could be an easy choice to say, sure, we'll go with that situation. Um, but we also have to consider that this whole crisis, which is now also a global crisis, mm -hmm. it's very closely connected to the brutality of the Assad regime and their way of dealing with their own country is just beyond cynical and vicious. And Keeping them in power is also just pushing a problem forward that's going to repeat itself 10, 20 years from now. Um, because their policies, their way of imprisoning people, torturing any kind of political opponents is not a new thing. It's been going on for 40 years. The crisis we have today, much more than it's about Syrian culture or um, just a natural result of a complex ethnic mix with complex ethnic mix, which of course it is too. It's foremost a result of the viciousness of the Assad regime. The camera, the camera, the film work in this film becomes sort of a character in a sense because you've got the you've got the Assad regime's cameras, you've got your cameras and your sort of intrusion into what's going on. And every now and then, you know, the camera goes down. It's uh, you're running. It's re interesting stylistically because I think uh, I think at some point. Um, I think she says that the regime fought art with violence, I think was the phrase. And so, so am I, is it fair to assume that for the many, many years, um, sure. you, you know, the hand would have gone in front of the camera, but in a much more violent way than just, hey, can you turn the camera off there, buddy? Well, there is a, a friend in the movie called Rabea, who is a heavy metal drummer. Yes. And, and it says in the film how that movement was cracked down Mm. much earlier. Mm. So, so a lot of these different kinds of movements for, that are not even political right. were, were, were cracked down. And um, o Obeda herself is, is talking oftentimes about how the, the ability to in any way define yourself outside of the norm was, was under heavy pressure the ability to be an individual, to define yourself, was, was extremely tough. So, um, to, to, to do, it was extremely tough to do that. So, um, yeah, it, um, I mean, we see it in many dictatorships yeah, absolutely. At, at different yeah. levels. Yeah. I'm always fascinated by the group, your group, this group, mm -hmm. that did actually you know, uh, find themselves in a sense, that, but, that but fought back. That's related a, to the camera, something that I mean, we played very consciously with it in, in the making of the film and the style, is that cameras used to be something that you would just use at weddings. Right. And suddenly it became a tool of self-expression and a tool of discovery. But it was something that everybody kind of had to learn from scratch because there was no experience to build on. But with the revolution in, in 2011, people going out on the street, it, it was a moment of, of extreme self-discovery on so many levels. And the camera was, was a part of that too. Uh, finding a language of how to use a camera. What can we do when we're together? And I test my camera on you. So we implemented that in, in the making of the film, film, where you really see them picking up the camera, starting to explore with one another yes. the language yes. of the revolution, the language of their own self-discovery. And, uh, and then it, it just um, grows from there also, where you start seeing the camera play a very active role in the revolution, going into the war, where the camera constantly is not only portraying reality, but definitely part of shaping reality all the time. And, and the way that people also act in front of the camera is playing roles to serve oftentimes I got, I different gotta, political I, agendas. I, I gotta say the one, I mean, I many, many moments that stand out for me in the film, but um, one in particular near the end with the, with the young boy with the gun, or the sign, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he yeah. doesn't know which side he's sort of cheering for. He's cheering There's for this a comical a moment. I don't Islamic know Islamic state while having a sign that says, <laughs> 
civil state. Yeah. And, uh, and he actually and he says, says, I was confused. I was confused. I just want to be yeah. on camera. Yeah. And it's great. It's um, really interesting. I think it also relates to that this self expression yes. was yeah, for sure. s such a, um, a strong need. That um, in in many cases, and, and and it said in in one, at one moment by Obeda's voiceover that the goal was not political. Uh, it was about disobedience. It was mm. about mm. Um, basically expressing obedience, something that you'd never been allowed. What do you say to people? And I've heard it quite a bit uh, in the last, I'd say, year and a half. And I'd love to talk to you a little bit about this this supposed ceasefire. Um, that's you know currently been imposed in the last 24 hours. That's going to go on for 10 days, etc. Um, I've heard many people say at different levels, uh, academically and just sort of over tea and coffee. Well, uh, I mean, isn't the reg current regime better than what would take its place? And so it's kind of like that's what we've been told. Uh, so therefore, you know, politically or ideologically, that's what we're going to have to support. As as bad as they are, it's kind of that whole lesser of two evils kind of thing. We, we discuss it. We, we discuss it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Also related to the film, can we use this film as as um, a way to put put light on certain issues and what what is the um, the right way forward? And uh, a Syrian friend told me yesterday, and I think he's kind of right. Number one, we have to think less about killing. So any kind of Thing that can create less suffering is in itself positive. Second, stop barrel bombing. Stop the regime's barrel bombing. It's a crazy kind of suffering that you see in areas that are under siege and, and are being barrel bombed, bombed. Then, once we get to that point, things will start opening up in various ways. But with the very locked situation that there's there right now, I think more than anything, it's it's really reduced the killing. Reduce the killing. Number one. Um, can you quickly unpack barrel bombing? So, is there something particularly Well, barrel particularly bombing is, brutal is a there? particularly brutal way of bombing because it's very imprecise, mm. and it's basically barrels full of explosives that are dropped over areas where people live, and. Um, there was a minister in the Assad government who was praising barrel bombs the other day because it cost like one, uh, like one percent of what missiles cost. So it's it's just it's a very effective way of um, creating suffering, basically. And and keeping and keeping costs down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, I think. I think you guys really humanize um, the conflict in a way that I haven't seen. Silvered Water was another film I saw a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, that, that humanized the, the, the war in a different way for me um, than, than yours did. The, the camaraderie of, of these friends, mm -hmm. uh, the community that was clearly already there, you know, the musician and the, the partying and kind of that blatant disregard for the regime mm -hmm. really comes through in a in a fun, playful way that I that I hope and I trust audiences are going to really resonate with. Was that just sort of the, the ethos of it, the culture of it, or did you guys intentionally say we really want to focus, we really want to make this a human film? Oh, and her voice as a narrator. Yeah, she's got a great voice. Oh, it's utterly brilliant. Um, it was a very uh, conscious choice for everyone. Number one, because Obeda was never a one-woman army. She was part of a group of friends, and, and each of their fates in different ways really show what has gone on in Syria. So we had to tell their stories. And for Obeda herself, it was also a great part of what kept her going making this film, which has been a painful process, mm. which was the desire to tell their stories and especially, of course, the ones that are no longer alive. So this was an important part. Uh, for me, uh, looking at, this, at it more as, as, a, as a story, I, I was fascinated about this meeting between, on the one level, a war movie and 
then this road trip mm. of mm -hmm. kind of beat generation <laughs> uh, of young people who are into not that it was a journalist who asked me um, the other day in Venice that um, or he told me they look very seem very Western and 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 I was just like well, what does that mean mm. that they're into mm. cool mm. stuff mm. that right. that they like music and right. they're exploring and they're curious uh, and it was just fantastic to see a group of people that were defined by things that I can relate to myself that um, remind me of the friends that I have in life and and I think many people watching the movie feel the same so um, so there was, was a very important thing to, to bring out because suddenly we're not defining each other by labels or defining right, each other right. from any political position or religious position we're just as human beings as human beings I love the line, and sadly we have to wrap it up, but Hassan the hero, uh, near the end of the film, uh, and I believe the narrated line is, sometimes a camera can inspire a hero. I thought <laughs> it was, you know, just to, to your comment earlier about, you know, that self-expression and that wanting to stand up, and then the young boy wanting to say something. Yeah, he was confused, but he still had to get it out. And, I, and, I, and you guys have done that. So thank you for a brilliant film, a great and an important film, The War Show. I'm here with Andreas Dasgood. Yep. And... Uh, Obeyed as a tune, co-directed by the two of them. It's here at the Toronto International Film Festival. And is there going to be another way to see it once uh, the festival is over? Will it be available online, or is it? It will ultimate? definitely be available yeah. online. But we're trying to plan the, of course, strategy of going first cinema release in North America. Then it'll get out on TV, VOD. Yeah, it's it's going to be on Canadian TV too. It's great. Well, thank you for your time and your generosity and your honesty, and, and really appreciate it. And again, congrats on the